This and the following lecture, GIP 10, will form a kind of contrasting pair. The main artists in them, Shun Zhou and Zhou Chun, represent for the Ming Dynasty the contrast of a great literatus artist who was counted as one of the four great masters of Ming painting and an unredeemably professional master who hasn't received as much attention as I think he deserves. Uh, partly because he was the teacher of two more famous Ming professional masters, that is Tang Yin and Chu Ying. These two, Shen Zhou and Zhou Chun, seem almost to pair in their names, to non-Chinese speakers at least. Uh, the one will sound almost like the reverse of the other. And the Zhou that was Shen Zhou's given name is Zhou Chun's surname. And I'll use them for another kind of contrast, the cultivated artist familiar with old styles, given to the practice of alluding to these old styles in his own paintings. Uh, he's really then gazing into the past. And on the other hand, an artist who makes few, if any, references to past painting and works rather in up-to-date styles and whose major work uh, that my lecture will be mostly about uh, uses no references to the past at all, but is all about the present. It might be called gazing out of my window. And the reason for that, you'll have to wait to find out. And it will be, I promise you, a revelation. This will be a familiar face to those of you who have kept up with these lectures. It's Richard Edwards, or Dick Edwards, my old friend and colleague, who taught at the University of Michigan in Ar Ann Arbor for many years. He merits a place at the beginning of this lecture because he was the author of the first book seriously devoted to a single Chinese painter published in this country. His book titled, The Field of Stones, A Study of the Art of Shenzhou, 1427 to 1509, published by the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. in 1962. The title is a translation of one of the names that Shenzhou used, Shurchan, literally, Field of Stones. Next. Here's a portrait of Shenzhou, painted by some anonymous portraitist, and inscribed by Shenzhou himself. I won't offer biographical information about him here because it's available at length in my Parting at the Shore book, in which he occupies most of the second chapter, uh, along with a section on his predecessors, in what comes to be called the Wu School, Wu being the old name for the Suzhou region. After the fall of Yuan and the beginning of the Ming, Suzhou takes some time to recover from the ravages of warfare that accompanied dynastic change. Uh, but in time, the tradition of the great Yuan masters is revived in that prosperous city, which continues as a major center of painting through the rest of the dynasty. Zhou Chun and his two famous pupils are all Suzhou or Wu school artists. Next, please. By being the scion of a wealthy landowning family, Shenzhou belonged to the privileged class that had access to collections of old paintings. Members of it would gather in each other's houses to look at these and discuss them. So he knew intimately the styles of the great masters of the Yuan period. Since most of you out there don't have this advantage by birth or training, let me review quickly why the, or who, that is, who these Yuan masters were and how they painted. Here are two works by Huang Gong Wang, a large album leaf from 1342, and a detail from his great Fuchun Mountain Scroll of 1350. From him, Shen Zhou learns the highly sophisticated kind of false naivete, false naivety, that uh, paints simple houses as a child might draw them, and shows no apparent skill in drawing, concentrating rather on brushwork and style. Next. From Wu Zheng, seen in two of his paintings here, he learned how to make simple compositions with ordinary materials, river shores and fishermen on the water, and also the use of a comfortably relaxed broad line drawing. These are two of Wu Zheng's fishermen hanging scrolls from the 1340s. Next. I haven't shown before, and I'll show here quickly in images taken from the Freer Gallery's website on Sun Yuan painting, sections of Wu Jun's famous fisherman hand scroll in the Freer Gallery, in which images of fishing boats on the river are accompanied by quatrains written in his hand. 
It opens with fishermen in boats seen alone on the river, continues with a passage with hills in the middle distance, his well-known pointy-topped hills, and at the right a quatrain with no boat. The boat is hidden behind the promontory, and he writes in his inscription, No Boat. Hujan is a great joker. Later in the scroll, the landscape ends with tall trees. More fishermen are seen actively fishing, uh, not just gazing and sleeping. And the scroll ends with some whimsically misdrawn buildings, playing on very old conventions for architectural drawing. Another similar scroll is in the Shanghai Museum. Both are probably genuine. He painted it twice. Next. From Nizan, two of his paintings we see here, he learned... Well, what could one learn from Nizon? How to paint landscapes in the Nizon manner, haha, <laughs> as we'll see him doing in several leaves in the album. The spare Nizon style, used for landscapes that offered nothing much in the way of scenery, continued to carry their weight as emblems of high literati culture. That I am not devoting a whole lecture to them in this series indicates my view of them, my late life view of them at least as ultimately rather a bore. Somebody's going to shoot me for saying that, but it needed saying. Next, please. From the far more interesting and creative Wang Meng, to whom I am devoted two lectures so far, he learns the densely packed mode of composition. Shenzhou paints uh, several landscapes of this kind. And from the late Wang Meng, as seen in the detail from the Liaoning Museum scroll, the one showing the approach to a temple, uh, which is the main subject of lecture number seven in the series, he learns more of this false naive, the false naive, amiable drawing and childlike simplicity. This becomes a basic and endearing feature of his style. Next, please. Looking back further, paintings associated with the tradition of Dungyuan, such as the one from which this is a detail, offered models for simple rural scenery with groves of trees and houses, all done in broad line drawing. Such a painting as, of, uh, as the small Wu Jun, seen on the right, former Crawford collection, now in the Met, uh, for the simple composition with minimal indications of landscape elements and human presence. Next. Finally, closer to his own time, his predecessor Wang Fu at the beginning of Ming, seen in the farewell painting that is reproduced in my parting at the shore book, represents a comfortable kind of continuation of Yuan literati traditions merged into a single style, the development treated in the pre shenzhou section of my second chapter. Next. Of Shenzhou's own works reproduced in that chapter of parting, I show these two. It left a small landscape painted, in, painted for his older friend Liu Zhui, with a long inscription that I partly translate, beginning, Mi Bu Mi, Huang Bu Huang, or Mi Fu isn't Mi Fu, Huang Gung Wang isn't Huang Gung Wang, <laughs> little joke, uh, which I won't be too complicated to explain here. Uh, at the right, a hanging scroll titled Night Vigil that uh, Shenzhou painted in 1492 with a long, very important inscription that I translate completely in my book. Next, please. Shenzhou's Scenes of Wu scroll showing notable places in the Suzhou region, I introduced in my lecture on authenticity and dating, along with what I take to be copies of it. I won't repeat those arguments here, except to say that the version on silk you see here seems to me to be clearly the one uh, that is genuine, for reasons that I laid out in detail there, and the others are copies. Next. Let me relate the story of how I came to make the slides that we're going to see keeping on the screen an image of the National Palace Museum outside Taipei. I wish I had a photograph of Zhang Zhou Shun, who was a curator there for many years, but unfortunately I don't. Zhang Zhou Shun was both a fine artist and a good scholar who did valuable studies of Wu school painting especially. He was prominent for a time among the Palace Museum staff and reached, as I remember, the position of chief curator or something like that but he had the misfortune to be opposed by a woman named, if I remember right, Martha Sue, something like that, who was a protege of the director. They were both Roman Catholics, 
and who took on Zhang Zhaoshan as her opponent, holding him down. I remember when there was a great world-class symposium at the Academia, Academia Sinica in Taipei, and a banquet was held at the Palace Museum, and I arrived to find Zhang Zhaoshan absent, not invited. Asking about him, I learned that he was in his office in the same building, so I went off to visit him there. I tried to bring Zhang Zhaoshan to the U.S. for a year, but that somehow didn't work out for reasons I forget. Anyway, it was Zhang Zhaoshan who had borrowed this great Shenzhou album, a work that was new to me then, and showed it to me in his house near the museum and allowed me to make slides from it. It belonged at that time to a private collector. I don't know who, what the name is. Later, Wenfeng tried to buy it for the Met. Very properly, I would have done the same if I had the money or the right position. But it was stopped by the Chinese government, who designated it a cultural property that couldn't be exported. So it's still presumably in some private collection in, in uh, Taiwan. Next. Now we arrive at last at the album that's the main subject of this lecture, to which all the foregoing has been leading up. And I show first Shenzhou's inscription leaf, which properly belongs at the end, to talk about how the album came into being. It's an album of 22 landscapes. There may have been one more originally. And it was painted over a five-year period for a certain Mr. Zhou Wei Da and finished in 1482. In that year, Shenzhou also wrote the inscription on it, which you see here, and which I translate as follows. This is on page 88 of my Parting at the Shore book. Here we go. I have a natural liking for painting landscapes, but I've never attained the samadhi, samai, the state of perfect concentration of mind similar to yoga, uh, the samadhi of the truly skilled artist. I do them, that is, but I'm not satisfied with them. When the right mood of exhilaration comes, then trusting my hand, that is painting not loosely, not really thinking much about it, I wield the brush and spread on the ink. It is only a way of employing my leisure and a sense of well-fed well well-being. I certainly have no intention of making them look attractive to people. Mr. Joe Wade uh, had this album mounted, that is, he had blank pieces of paper mounted as an album, and has been asking me for a long time to do paintings in it. Sometimes they did only one leaf a year, at other times several in a month. In five years, 23 leaves have heaped up. But Weida is still eager with the paintings finished. Now he wants an inscription. He won't let me off lightly. It's enough to make the avaricious seeker give up after seeing him. Weida's intention, however, is futile. Since the paintings don't satisfy me, how can they satisfy others? If they don't satisfy others, what is his reason for insisting on having them? It is as ridiculous as a hungry hawk going after a rotten rat. But Weida wishes to take full responsibility for it. What a laugh. Run Yin year of the Chung Hua era, that is 1482 in our calendar. Fifth day of the intercalary, eighth month, inscribed by Shun Zhou. So that's, uh, that is Chen Zhou's inscription now going on. But this, as I write in my book, is conventional self-depreciation. Chen Zhou has, in fact, devoted a great deal of time and his best efforts to these leaves, which are among his most imaginatively conceived works. His debt to Zhou Wei Da, whatever it was, must have been a large one. Also, we can guess that some real exasperation must underlie the ostensibly joking complaints he makes about Mr. Zhou's impatience and his importuning, and that Sun Zhou must have been genuinely relieved when the work was completed and could be delivered. Other artists, as we know from written evidence, sometimes employed ghost painters to paint works in their style for them to sign when they became too piled up with commissions. Sun Zhou probably never did. He was not a properly commercial artist, and his debts and obligations belong rather to the Chinese Guanxi system. How that system worked, we can learn from an excellent book by Craig Kunis titled Elegant Debts, The Social Art of Wan Zheng Ming, University of Hawaii Press 2003, which is about just that problem for Sun Zhou's sort of student, Wan Zheng Ming. 
That is how the artist incurred and discharged debts of that kind. Very much worth reading. Uh, this first leaf from the album, Next Please. This first leaf is a moody picture painted in ink and white colors in broad, wet brush strokes, depicting a man standing by a stream at the base of a waterfall beneath a bare tree. He holds a staff indicating age and infirmity, and he gazes out over the water, absorbed by the atmospheric turmoil around him. Next. Behind him and behind leafy trees is a simply drawn pair of roofs representing his dwelling, from which he has ventured out to stand in what must be for him a favorite place. A thick layer of fog or mist extends diagonally across the whole composition and also moves into the foreground in lower left. Next. If we exercise our gazing into the past function, and try to say what old style Shunjo is recalling or evoking here, we might at first say style of Mifu and his son because of the repeated pointed peaks and the large dots on the nearest one. But if we are familiar with ground painting, we can recognize that he is recalling even closer to his time. Next, please. The early Yuan master Gao Kegong, who took up this style or some elements of it as a landscapist, here is his best-known hanging scroll landscape, titled Clouds and Circling Luxuriant Peaks, bearing an inscription dated 1309. It's figure 19 in my Hills Beyond a River book, uh, the one on Yuan painting. This image is taken from the Chinese edition of that book, where it appears in color on page 49. I don't have an original slide of it easily accessible. The band of mist, the shapes of the peaks, the trees below, all these are similar. Next, please. Or even closer, this shorthand scroll by the same artist in the Palace Museum in Beijing, preserved in fragmentary form with parts missing. It was partly burned after being removed from the imperial collection. The peaks, the band of fog, the leafy trees are all similar. Gao Kegong was a scholar official artist working in the Mongol government in the early Yuan period. His family had come from Western Asia with the Mongols. Next, please. The second leaf seen here is not in any identifiable old style, at least not one that I can identify. Although the group of bare and leafy trees might recall similar groups in Hong Gong Wang's paintings, we don't need to identify an old master behind each of the leaves, even though Sun Zhou may have had one in mind as he painted. Here, the scholar with his staff crosses a bridge in the lower left, followed, if I am reading right the minimal indications, followed by his boy servant. He is approaching a Tingza viewing shoulder on a flat bank, placed so that someone sitting in it can look across at the waterfall. It's typical of Shunjo that he fails to plant the supports of his Tingza firmly on the ground. Three of them appear to rest precariously on the very edge of the bank. But Shunjo is not the kind of artist who gets such things right. Getting them slightly wrong is, in fact, part of his amiable amateurishness. Next, please. The detail doesn't clear up the presence of or absence of the boy servant, but it does reveal some of the more admirable aspects of Shunjo's best painting. The rendering of the tree groups in thick strokes, avoiding flattening repetition, the easy shaping of the earth masses in foreground, and the middle ground cliff, we begin to see why Shunjo, without troubling to develop a high level of technique, became for his admirers the ideal amateur in Ming painting. Next. Another leaf that has no clear stylistic derivation and is more complex in its composition, again revealing one of Shunjo's special strengths. A man is seen working at his desk through the open window of his tile-roofed house over a wattle fence, with bamboo overhanging at left and leafy trees at right. On the flat top projecting bank above to the right is another Tingza, its outer legs again planted precariously on the outer edge. But I must stop looking at Sun Zhou's paintings as though they were true, accurate representations, as Tingza and its placement are conventional signs. The stream behind him flows under a simple bridge 
and winds into a forest in the distance. Next. Shenzhou's broad, slow-moving brushstrokes belong to an inimitable style that makes him, as I say, the ideal amateur artist, displaying no showy technique while exhibiting a total mastery within his self-imposed limitations. He doesn't try for subtle atmospheric effects or subtle shading for roundness or lighting or sensuous renderings of surfaces, but one doesn't miss those in the presence of his easy control of his personal mode of representation. Next, please. Another leaf in which no antique style is easily recognizable. In this one, the man in lower left approaches his house, also using a cane. The season indicated by the color of the leafy trees is autumn, and perhaps a sense of old age is intended, the autumn of one's life, that is. Inside the house, we see the entryway absurdly enlarged so that it occupies nearly the whole space of the house. If we are generous, we suppose that Chunjo has enlarged it to reflect the man's concentration on this welcoming space before him as he nears it. Another waterfall, another potent symbol, if one's thinking goes that way, pours down from the hill at left, its origin as usual, unshown and mysterious. But again, I'm making the mistake of looking for representational logic in the work of a determinedly anti-realistic master. Next, please. A detail showing more clearly the entryway of the man's house, inside which is a low table with a bronze ding tripod vessel sitting on it. We must always allow the possibility that Shunjo's pictures in this album incorporate some knowledge of his patron and intended recipient Chu Wei Da and his habits and his preferences. The drawing is in those thick, blunt strokes that can be read as expressions of Chun Zhou's own personality, open, relaxed, genial. Next. In this leaf, the foreground to middle ground landscape elements are flat-topped masses, like small plateaus, colored as always, Chun Zhou's coloring is surprisingly consistent, colored with pale blue-green tops and yellowish sides that recede from lower left to middle right. On one of them is the familiar tingza, this one of the roof that appears to be made of reeds or sticks, its three outer legs resting again on the verge of the earth bank. A man sits on the edge, perhaps with his legs dangling over, gazing at, at nothing, unless it be the thick fog that covers much of the shore across from him not this time forming a horizontal or diagonal band, but more natural patches that adapt to the shape of the land masses they cover. Next. Correction, he's not gazing at nothing, but looking up a defile, a ravine, kind of, out of which a stream seems to flow. This, like so much else in these pictures, is ambiguous representationally. The dien dotting, vibrating on and outside the edges of the landscape forms, and the dotting suggesting vegetation on the opposite bank set up a pleasant surface resonance. The edges of the fog are soft in this picture, merging into the land masses that they cover. More of technique than we recognize at first becomes apparent as we look longer, and our respect for Sun Zhou's achievement only grows. Next. A simple picture, painted in ink only, showing two fishermen offshore from their houses, which are set between a few trees and some tall stalks of some kind of reeds or other waterside plants. The same stalks are seen on the distant shore, these blown by the wind. A flight of geese is seen in the sky. I have no detail of this one and don't need one since nothing in it asks to be seen more closely. The model this time is almost certainly, next please, Wu Jun's Fisherman Hand Scroll, which I showed at the beginning. The, the hills with the pointed tops in the distance across the water and the two fishermen in their boats, one fishing quietly, the other engaged more actively, with his pole lifted, uh, locating the fishermen so close to the shore and planting a group of leafy and bare trees on the shore also may echo Wu Jun's painting. But where Wu Jun located a kind of houseboat with somebody sleeping in it on the shore beneath the trees, Shundro draws houses, 
either misremembering or deliberately changing the image. Next. The leaf that follows is another that's in no special style, and it's relatively simple in composition. A grove of dark trees across the foreground, growing on land that is broken only in the center by a stream, a bridge, a few houses on the shore, more houses partly hidden in the trees across on the opposite shore, an absolutely horizontal band of fog across the center, and a lumpy topped hill with the usual waterfall pouring from it at top. At the left is a more distant pointed peak shown only in paler ink silhouette, and beyond those and above the main bluff still more distant peaks shown in pale blue. We have to imagine that Shunjo, during the five years he was working on the album, had days when he lacked inspiration but felt he had to produce another leaf anyway to follow a program he had set for himself, perhaps. This appears to be a product of one of those days. The watery line formed by the tops of the trees is answered above by the equally wavery hilltop, following lumpy forms colored pale blue and yellow-orange, probably alluding distantly to the lumpy top forms of Dungyuan's and Juran's so-called Alum Rock Convention. Next, please. The next leaf, an ink only, is another from which I made no detail, since everything of interest can be seen in the whole, and it's not, so far as I can see, in any old style. A man sits upright in his boat, moored outside his boathouse, gazing at nothing in particular across the river. Tall, leafless trees growing on the shore lean over him. What he appears to gaze at across the river is nothing more than a patch of some kind of reeds, growing diagonally. The river flows out of distance. A tall mountain is only a pale silhouette. And that's all there is. There isn't any more. Next, please. This leaf is more interesting in theme and composition. A winter landscape with a single figure, painted without any reference to old style that I can make out. It holds our interest longer. We may think at first that the man seen in the center has come, has come across the angled bridge, which, if it were real, would fall down when it, when it was first crossed, since the crucial angle point is unsupported. Anyway, that uh, we might think that he has crossed this bridge and is returning home. But then we notice, just left of center at the bottom, the boat on the shore by which this man has probably arrived. He's a visitor making his way toward the house, or else an occupant of the house returning from a trip, perhaps, but it's too cold for an outing. The trees are mostly bare, but the distant ones still show some reddish autumnal foliage. Next, please. Looking more closely, we see that a flag flies above the buildings, identifying them, as we know from countless Sung period paintings of landscapes with travelers, as some kind of inn or stopping place. So that is where the traveler is headed. His road up to it is almost blocked at the far right by a very dark boulder or earth mass. Lots of details in this leaf show signs of second thoughts or changes of plan. And the final picture, which a professional artist probably would have thrown away and started over, using up one of his fine pieces of paper, still holds our interest, as I've demonstrated by talking about it for so long. Next. The next leaf is clearly in the needs-on manner with all the familiar parts of his landscapes to be seen, only rearranged into a different kind of composition than Nidzon would have painted, and with the addition of a figure, which Nidzon never painted. When he was asked why he's supposed to have replied, I quote from memory, something like, that it was because he didn't, didn't think there was anybody around in his world anymore. Shunjo's Tingza is set, as usual, with its outer supports planted on the very edge of the projecting bank. Behind the man, in lower left, is a small waterfall that pours down, again an activating element that Nizan wouldn't have included. The trees could truly have come from a Nizan landscape. Shunjo can reproduce them closely when he chooses to. Next. The build-up of the landscape at right, with an overhanging cliff, gives the scene a dramatic power that is Shunjo's own, and makes this one of the strongest leaves, I think. 
The horizontal dien or dots put on with a brush held slanting accurately reproduce a feature of Nizan's paintings. Altogether, this leaf could be used to exemplify the highly successful combination of allusions to old styles and individual creativity that characterizes Shunzhou's painting at its best, and it could be taken as a major goal of later literati painting generally. I'll expand on that observation later. Next. Moving out onto the projecting riverbank, we can imagine ourselves sitting in the Tingzhe and gazing out at, at what? Not at any distant shore, because there isn't any, or anything else to attract our gaze, except, and this is odd, a single seal positioned up in the sky, just where one would gaze. Seeing it up close, but unclearly with my old eyes, I took out from my reference bookshelf my original edition of Kontag and Wang, Maler und Sammler Stempel der Aus der Ming und Qing Zeit, that is, painters and collectors' seals from the Ming and Qing periods, Shanghai in 1940, uh, the book that Victoria Kontag and C.C. Wang put together when she was living in Shanghai. Uh, I took it out to check the seal against the Shunzhou seals that are reproduced there, full-sized and in red, as I have done countless times in the past, and it checked perfectly. C.C. Wang himself always warned against the practice of comparing seals to determine authenticity in a painting, saying that it doesn't work, and I completely agree, don't do that, but that's another issue. There's no question of authenticity here in any case, so I wasn't really checking it for authenticity, just to sort of identify the seal. Next, please. Opening this great old book took me back over many years. I learned how to use it from Wang himself and wrote a new preface at his request for a Hong Kong reprint of 1966, reprinted again in 1982. And I talked about it with Victoria Kontag herself when I spent time with her. But holding the book itself, the original commercial press edition of 1940, which of course I myself acquired much later, well, the weight, the feel, the sight of this elegantly produced old book, clearly printed in large size on good paper, with all the seals in red, aroused a sad feeling in me. Is the age of the well-produced book over, or nearly so? The shabby small print things that I've too often received lately when I order new books suggest that it is over. And, to quote Hamlet, there is the respect that makes calamity of so long life. If you've lived long enough to outlive, that is, the production of well-designed and well-printed books, well, I won't finish that sentence. And don't tell me that the internet has replaced them. Devoted as I am to exploiting the special strengths of that, it doesn't replace the book. But enough of this mournful soliloquy. Back to finish with Chunzhou's album. Next. The next to last leaf is another of the moody, wet brush landscapes, loosely in the manner of Gao Kogong, with pointed peaks disappearing into distance, and the band of fog here sensitively treated with soft edges that merge with the surrounding masses, stretching across the center of the composition. The whole picture is unified by the wet, softening atmosphere. A figure is seen, perhaps two, in the open upper story of a large building above the trees. Next. Looking more closely at the lower right corner, we see that a man appears there crossing a bridge on his way to join his friends in the storied house, probably. The detail also shows how effectively Shunzhou has separated two planes of depth by drawing the nearer, one, the nearer groves of trees darker and with more detailed foliage, those further back paler and more blurred. For all his deliberate amateurishness, Shunzhou exhibits in passages like this a remarkable technical control the large umbrella that the figure holds over him tells us that a heavy rain is falling and that we are viewing the scene through this rain. Next. The last leaf in the album is another in the manner of needs on, done in ink only, and another that violates or supplements that landscape manner by introducing a more detailed house than needs on would have painted and showing a man seated in it. The group of trees is derived closely from the Yuan Master, as are the stalks of tall bamboo growing behind the house. Next. 
The mountains near and far, seen in the upper half, right half of the leaf, all have more or less the same pointed top form. Even the small hills interjected across the space between the large composite form nearby and the pale silhouette in the distance. The dien, dots, some of them horizontal, others upright, supply the necessary vibrancy without really representing anything except possibly unspecified vegetation. Next. Seen closer, the house proves to be empty except for the figure in it. Perhaps some kind of rest shelter is intended. The man sits quietly, gazing once more at nothing in particular. We have seen Shunzhou in this album as a consummate master of the kind of later Chinese painting that echoes the past without losing the quality of originality. Long ago, writing an essay for the memorial volume for my good friend Joseph Levinson after his untimely death, my essay titled Style as Idea in Ming Ching Painting, published in 1976, I showed how Levinson, brilliant as he was, had misunderstood the practice of fang, imitation, in later Chinese painting, and he had taken Dong Chi Chang to be a conservative imitative artist because Dong Chi Chang wrote so much about imitating the past in so many of his inscriptions on his paintings. As I wrote, Levinson had misunderstood the nature of Dong Chi Chang's so-called copying because we art historians hadn't done our job properly our job of defining how that practice really worked, how it was in no way incompatible with originality, even brilliance, how it wasn't mere imitation at all. And as I went on to point out, this could only be done through visual comparisons. That is, the book readers had been totally unable to deal effectively with the idea of Fang. Um, next, please. Comparisons of the kind that I make throughout these lectures showing how the later artists could allude to the earlier works and their styles, remind the knowing viewers of them, calling up visual memories in their mind's eyes, without in any way compromising their own creativity and originality. I used to use musical analogies for this because of my own deep engagement with that kind of music. French composers especially could evoke old styles achingly, as Ravel evokes Couperin and other earlier composers in the theme music for this series, his Tombeau de Couperin, as played by my daughter Sarah. If I can convey now to more viewers of these video lectures how this practice of fang imitation works visually, I will have accomplished something that I believe to be very important, a very important aspect of later Chinese painting, that is. Indeed, as I argued in my lecture article, some thoughts on the history and post-history of Chinese painting, uh, the essential quality or practice that most tellingly characterizes later Chinese painting. We can't really understand what many of the best of later Chinese painters are up to, that is, and I always told my students that our ultimate job was to find out and write about what the artist was up to. We can't find this out without defining just how this practice of creative imitation really works. And we can only do that with visual comparisons. And with that far-reaching and maybe self-serving observation, I end this lecture, which, as I said at the beginning, can be thought of as one of a pair, in that it will be followed by a contrasting lecture about the Ming artist Zhou Chun that isn't a gazing into the past lecture at all. Rather, in its climactic treatment of a great series of paintings by Zhou Chun, it might be termed gazing out of my window, just the thing that Chinese artists were not supposed to be doing. So come back next lecture to join me in looking at that. Mm -hmm.